Okay. Are we live now? I'm a little bit new to this. Yes, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, welcome to this second session of uh, on uh, values in a divided world, the clash of rule-based rule order versus might makes right. Uh, I'm uh, Dr. Stefan Berg, the U.S. coordinator of the International Association for Academicians uh, for Peace and your moderator today. Um, the task at hand is to shed some light on, on the one hand, the persistent yearning around the globe for a unified world of interdependence, <laughs> mutual prosperity and universal values. And the stark contrast in the human history of conflict now playing out in uh, between uh, Russia and Ukraine. Is there more than one value system in effect? Where is the motivation? There is one uh, as confessed around the world based in the uh, in God's love of unconditional, unconditional giving expressed in the harmonious ecological cycles of the universe. But how is it then, even though uh, we have we seem to have this inside that uh, groups of people with seeming different loyalties values and motivation tend to dominate those that long-term global vision and instead ruthless, ruthlessly compete with each other for power and influence so that's what we're going to address here the value conundrum present and in the this mire of propaganda and strong feelings so to start with, we're going to show a short clip uh, from uh, the UPF-sponsored World Summit for Peace on the Korean Peninsula uh, just two months ago in February 2022 in Seoul, South Korea, given by the former U.S. Secretary, Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo. He um, is a, you may know him, but as an intro, he is an American diplomat politician and businessman or represented Kansas fourth congressional district three times prior to becoming the CIA director in 2017. And as the US Secretary of State from 2018 to 2021, he went to Korea three times, both the Seoul and Pyongyang. And he personally met with the, the North Korean great leader Kim Jong-un and the Chinese Communist Party chairman Xi and Putin of Russia, Russia and a number of other powerful world leaders. He's a West Point graduate and uh, had active duty in Germany, got a doctorate from Harvard Law School. Okay, let us, without any further ado, roll, roll this clip from the, the World, world Summit, Summit for Peace in Korean Peninsula. Out of the work that remains to be done. It is glorious to be here today with you to continue this mission. We, uh, there is a path forward. There's a path forward for the people of North Korea as well, and we pray for them each and every day. That path most importantly consists of the challenge of our times, the challenge that is presented. We can see this in ways grand and simple. Let us not forget that not too terribly long ago, 20 Indian soldiers were killed in a violent incursion by the Chinese military on their border in the Himalayas, and Chinese aggression that continues today, even in the Pacific Islands. For America to confront this, these lawless authoritarians, we must lead from the front, putting strength and power against the problem set. And we must work closely with our friends, our friends here in South Korea, our friends in Australia, our friends in Japan, our friends in India, and indeed all peace-loving nations and peoples of the world. First and foremost, this always must be through diplomacy. I think that's why President Trump sent his most senior diplomat to have conversations with Chairman Kim to share the vision for a brighter future for Chairman Kim, for the people of, the, of North Korea, and indeed for the entire peninsula. Our vision was right. Our vision was noble. Our vision would indeed have made lives better for each of those people. 
and it would have reduced risk, uh, risk around the world. But we all know, sadly, that if it is dialogue which becomes the sine qua non for success, if it's just about talking, then we won't create the peace that we are all gathered here this weekend to try and foster. Everyone who remembers the great work that President Reagan did knows the simple motto of peace through strength. It's no less true today than it was in those times. It was evident in the sanctions that the entire world placed on North Korea, not to punish the North Korean people, indeed for just the opposite purpose, in an attempt to create the conditions that would make each of their lives better. And the combined strength that I saw the American military working alongside the South Korean military to convince Chairman Kim that all of the missiles and all of the noise and all of the power with which he attempts to coerce this nation will be met with the firm resolve that is required today and tomorrow and the years in front of us. I, uh, I pray that this one family will unite. I pray that this one place will come together. There was no simpler, prouder moment of mine than when I was able to return to the United States of America with three Americans that had been held by that evil regime. If we're united, if we are steadfast, if we show the same resolve that the people of South Korea have shown and that we have gathered here with this united peace effort, I'm very confident that we will achieve that and the greater glory that every human being is entitled to because our Creator made it so will continue to flourish around the world and indeed on this very peninsula. Thank you for allowing me to be with you today. May God bless each and every one of you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, thank you, Mr. Pompeo. That was uh, uh, lessons from real life. Somebody is moving on the highest level and uh, uh, getting information about uh, the real situation. His message seemed to indicate peace through strength, and we appreciate that. Seems definitely be a contest of strength in Ukraine at this time. Um, one person, our next speaker, is going to be uh, Dr. Alexander Cromwell. He is Associate Director, Dean's Scholar, and Experimental Learning at the Elliott School at GW uh, George Washington University, where he teaches courses on conflict resolution, how we can stop getting involved in these things. His research focuses on education in conflict contexts, and has, he has worked with encounter-based programs with Pakistani, Afghan, Indonesian, and youth, uh, U.S. youth among his over 10 years of global peace education programs. He previously taught courses at American University and George Mason University, where he, where he also received his Ph.D. Dr. Con Cromwell, Please share your thoughts with us. How can we avoid these kind of conflicts? The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Berg. Um, I'm very happy to be here and uh, looking forward to contributing to this really important conversation on this question of you know how we um, how we can find right values that still cut across and connect us um, while also holding you know holding these problematic. Uh, regimes accountable for their atrocities, right? And so um, I've put a few slides together just to kind of aid in my presentation today, but I really wanted to talk through some of this of, you know, how, how we can um, try to approach this issue. You know, as you mentioned, you know, my field is conflict resolution. I, sp I spent a lot of time studying about, teaching about, and, and you know, doing uh, conflict resolution and peace building work. And so uh, the big question I think is, we you know, um, as Secretary Pompeo was saying, right, we, we need to hold regimes accountable. We need to uh, advocate for peace through strength, right? We, 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 we can't just sit by and let authoritarian regimes do whatever they want. The question becomes, right, once you, um, you know, end the violence or, uh, you know, have uh, resolved the conflict to some extent, how do you rebuild? How do you build on shared values that exist? And that's kind of what I want to talk a little bit about today. 
So, you know, uh, Dr. Berg just alluded to uh, Russia and Ukraine, and I think that's a, a really good place to start, right? So, you know, we know that uh, Russia invaded Ukraine about, you know, six weeks ago. We know that uh, this is an example of an, of an, of an authoritarian aggressor uh, invading a democratic country just for their own uh, aims. There's no justification for the invasion. Um, the picture here is from a Buka, Buka, which is a suburb of Kiev that was, um, which Russia recently retreated from. And, you know, there are reports that New York Times reported that, you know, about uh, 300 civilians were tortured and killed um, as Russia left. And I think, you know, what's most clear about Russia's aims and their actions in the war are how they've treated civilians, right? There's been indiscriminate bombing of civilians, including as they've tried to flee various areas, right? And in those kinds of actions, they, they violate the Geneva Conventions, uh, and they very clearly show a lack of respect um, for human, you know, human beings and human dignity. Um, and so the question becomes, again, okay, so, you know, how do we challenge Russia and how do we, uh, and, and authoritarian regimes of that nature, while also trying to build a sustainable, peaceful world. And so with that in mind, I wanted to draw a bit from some of the ideas in conflict resolution as we try and think about it and tackle this issue. So um, in the field of peace building, there's a, there's a prominent scholar, John Paul Lederach, and um, in his book, prominent book on peace building, he poses this question. He says, how do we transcend the cycles of violence that bewitch our human community while still living in them? Because here's the problem with violence and war, right? We get trapped in cycles where cycles of revenge, right? Where, you know, because of the pain and suffering that one group experiences, they then, you know, want to go back and inflict that same pain on, on the other side, right? And so, um, and I wanted to repose this question slightly differently, thinking about, you know, our conversation today, which is about how you challenge authoritarian aggressors. So I think the question is, so how do we find common values with authoritarian aggressors while holding them accountable for their actions. Um, and, you know, essentially the goal of peace building is to find points of connection after incredible moments of disconnection, right? Violence, war, and torture, um, and, and things that are really unforgivable, right? How do you find forgiveness? How do you find a way to move forward? And this isn't to say to forgive and forget. Forgive and forget is actually a problematic notion, right? Uh, we're not saying we forget, right? When we talk about the Holocaust, we say never forget, right? So we don't forget what happens, but we still figure out how to recognize the humanity of the other despite what they've done. Uh, and we figure out how to move forward uh, despite the situation. Um, and so I wanted to uh, put forward a few quotes that just uh, address um, how to talk about these issues from, from prominent peace builders. So first, uh, Martin Luther King said, nonviolence means avoiding not only external physical violence, but also internal violence of spirit. You not only refuse to shoot a man, but you refuse to hate him. Uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, who's a famous Vietnamese Buddhist peace builder, once said, how can we love our enemy? The only way is to understand them, to understand how they have come to be the way they are. And finally, Mother Teresa said, we're all capable of good and evil. We're not born bad. Everybody has something good inside. Some hide it, some neglect it, but it is there. And I think the, the most important lesson in all of this, right? So again, we absolutely, you know, Russia and other, you know, authoritarian aggressors need to be held accountable, right? Um, for their actions. Uh, there's no excuse for their invasion of Ukraine. Um, but one thing we have to keep in mind when we're trying to work with them, when we're trying to right, end the conflict, figure out a way to stop the violence and then figure out how to, how to move forward. In, in conflict resolution, there's an idea called separating the person from the problem. In other words, what often happens is when, you know, for example, we see Putin, uh, Putin's aggression, aggression in Ukraine and, and the invasion of Ukraine, um, what happens is we start to see all Russians as, you know, inherently bad and, and, um, and it's easy to generalize, right, those kind of like feelings of anger, frustration or hatred from just, you know, the actors who need to be held responsible, right, the, the leaders in power to the, to the overall population. So one of the big things in terms of thinking about um, 
the values that connect us to the ways that we can move forward is, is you know, trying to, to, to recognize the similarities we have with people. And in conflict resolution, that's one of our biggest goals, right? Um, because the idea is by focusing, by still remembering those similarities, by still seeing the humanity in the other, by figuring out some way to build trust and respect, we'll be more likely to deal with the real issues. Um, and so that, so, so because, right, we'll have a, a, a positive relationship and a trust that we can build. Now, of course, this gets really difficult when you have a regime that uh, regularly lies, right? Um, and this was a challenge with the Soviet Union, right, where there were all these peace conferences between, you know, the United States and the Soviet Union and various kind of, um, uh, you know, initiatives that people started <clears throat> that were started by the Soviets, and, and they, they weren't taking them seriously, right? They were not um, actually committed to these efforts. They were just a way, you know, to buy time or to, you know, get people in the U.S. who were trying to promote peace to believe in them while, while manipulating the situation. Um, you know, it's a common to the same tactic is used by dictators throughout the world. For example, right, Bashar al-Assad went to so many negotiations to end the conflict in Syria and never actually intended to uh, compromise or stop killing civilians as he was doing. He was buying time, right, because he had Russia's support all along. Um, and so, you know, we do have to keep in mind that when it comes to peacemaking, when it comes to trying to end conflict that, you know, we don't want to just uh, blindly believe and trust the other side, um, when, particularly when it's an authoritarian regime and a bad actor. But even in those cases, right, the question is, how do we still love our enemy while not condoning their actions? And how do we still see the fact that we also have evil inside of us in the same way that they do and figure out ways that we can collaborate on what is still good? Um, so with that in mind, just uh, I wanted to highlight, you know, show um, the goal, you know, in moving past a situation like this is reconciliation. So what you see on here is the conflict curve, right? So at the apex of conflict, right at the top of the curve, is when there's the greatest amounts of violence, right? And this is when we sit down and we have negotiations and you see peacemaking up there. This is where when we engage in peacemaking processes, right? And this is the stage the Ukrainian conflict is currently in. But the thing is, after the violence ends, once there's a peace, you know, a peace agreement or a peace accord, the more deeper question is a question of long term, right? It's a question of long term reconciliation, which you see on the bottom of the of the curve here, right? So once you know, once conflict is at its top and you reach a peace, reach a peace agreement, the question is, how do we deescalate? How do we get back to a place where we where we can you know understand each other again? And we're pretty far from that, right? Um, when it comes to trying to deal with these authoritarian regimes. And it's going to be a long-term kind of question or goal, right, for us to get to. But it's something um, to keep in mind. And so in thinking about reconciliation, I wanted to just put forward a framework from Lederach um, and just another example, and then I'll conclude. So when we're talking about, you know, reconciliation or reconnecting through shared values, what does that look like? So Lederach actually, um, in his book, Building Peace, he cites Psalm 85.10 and says, Reconciliation occurs when truth and mercy have met together, justice and peace have kissed. And what he's talking about here, um, and he, he applied this specifically to the peace negotiations in Nicaragua, um, you know, many years ago, and talked about how this was kind of the guiding principle they had when they were, when they were engaging in negotiations. And what's really critical here, right, is thinking about how you merge truth and mercy and justice and peace, right? So truth has to do with the atrocities that have happened, right? Holding people account, um, you know, being clear about everybody knowing what really happened, right? But then you have to balance that with forgiveness, right? With mercy, with thinking about how we can heal our relationships and move forward. And the other tension is between justice and peace, right? Justice is about making things right, creating equality, again, holding people accountable. How are we going to prosecute former perpetrators? Right? How is Putin going to be held accountable for, for all the, the, the Ukrainian deaths at his hands? Um, but then that has to be balanced with peace, right? With somehow developing harmony and well being for all. Um, but again, peace sometimes comes at too great of a price. With the example we were talking about, you know, previously with the Soviet Union kind of talking about peace but not being serious about it, right? Um, so Martin Luther King, 
you know, very strongly advocates that true peace is not merely the absence of tension, it's the presence of justice. So to conclude, I, I wanted, um, I have a quote from Paul Kagame, who's the, the current president of Rwanda, talking about, you know, the Rwandan genocide back in 1994, right? You had, we had about 800,000 Tutsis and moderate Hutus were killed. Um, and so Kagame talks about this challenge of building reconciliation in society. And so I wanted to end with a quote from him just to think about how we can um, build on shared values in, in, in moving forward towards the future. So Kagame said, there was a huge puzzle after the genocide. How do you pursue justice when the crime is so great? You can't lose 1 million people in 100 days without an equal number of perpetrators. But we also can't imprison an entire nation. So forgiveness was the only path forward. Survivors were asked to forgive and forget. The death penalty was abolished. We focused our justice on the organizers of the genocide. Hundreds of thousands of perpetrators were rehabilitated and released back into their communities. These decisions were agonizing. I constantly questioned myself. But each time, I decided that Rwanda's future was more important than justice. It was a huge burden to place on the survivors, and perhaps the burden was too great. One day during a memorial service, I was approached by a survivor. He was very emotional. Why are you asking us to forgive? He asked me. Haven't we suffered enough? We weren't the cause of this problem. Why must we provide the solution? These were very challenging questions. So I paused for a long time. Then I told him, I'm very sorry. You are correct. I'm asking too much of you, but I don't know what to ask the perpetrators. Sorry won't bring back any lives. Only forgiveness can heal this nation. The burden rests with the survivors because they are the only ones with something to give. And so just to conclude, right, you know, as Mother Teresa said, um, and as Thich Nhat Hanh said, right, finding the ability, and, and Martin Luther King has also said, right, finding the ability to love our enemy, even despite the, the, the atrocities they're committing, so that we can find some way forward, is really critical to dealing with the current issues we're facing. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Cromwell, for those words of wisdom. And not only words of wisdom from deep thinkers, but also words of wisdom from those people who have been at it. Uh, Rwanda, that paints a really um, shocking but real picture. Forgiveness. Well, there are only some people left. and. Uh, and you also mentioned uh, separate uh, the person from the problem, not uh, paint everybody with the same brush. But in in a, in a sense, some people may do that. So the point is, how can we get out of that? And uh, yeah, thank you very much for your illuminating um, uh, comments on that topic. Um, now we're going to move on to our ne next presenter which is uh, Dr. Uh, oh no, Reverend Zachary Oliver. He also comes from Washington, D.C., where he is a vice president of the Universal Peace Federation, specifically tasked to bridge the divide between religion, nations, races, and cultures. He's, he's a president and active leader of many groups among this uh, bridging the gap, which is between American, African, and the Caribbeans through economic and social program. and. He himself actually has lived in Grenada for several years. He works with the Moral Black Leadership Foundation to uphold faith and family. He is a, he is a consultant president of the National Faith-Based Empowerment Coalition, working with financial opportunity zones around America and uh, many other uh, groups uh, in which he is involved. So he is a a very busy man, and I really look forward to hear his comment. Uh, Reverend Oliver, please. Yeah, well, thank you, Dr. Berg. Um, it's always a pleasure to be on a panel or in the same session with you. And I want to also thank Dr. Cromwell uh, for his uh, extraordinary remarks. I really took in a lot. It was really great. So I look forward to our panel discussion. But I would like just to go on um for myself giving some comments on this universal values and <clears throat> in a divided world and uh it's a very interesting topic the clash of rule based order versus might makes right um 
as you know, we are tr in the transitional era, era in history when the world is experiencing extraordinary challenges, fundamental technology disruptions causing massive economic restructuring and worsening problems, economic uh, inequality, global climate changes already creating diverse environmental crisis and ex ex existential uh, uncertainty, a global pandemic now in its third year, having killed 6.2 million people thus far, a massively destructive war in Europe with worldwide significance, with no end in sight, the emergence of ideological or uh, ideolo ideology based bipolar world old order. It is shared values, shared beliefs that hold society together during turbulent times such as these. When we use the word value, we are referring to underlining shared beliefs that are like paste. Values generates the ideal and vision that provides social cohesion, that produces unity, promoting connectivity and respect for our fellow man and woman. For instance, altruism, which is rooted in the value of love and respect for others, is the principle that motivates us all to act, to reach out to help our fellow citizen transcend the race and color without thinking twice. This value-based motivation is crucial to putting one in the frame of mind to overcome the division and the inequality to have compassion for the inability, excuse me, to have compassion for your fellow citizens, especially when he or she is not of the same race. In this context, let us not ex accept the persistent contradictions and values and principles that has remained present even in our country here in America since its founding. When we look at the stubborn divisions between black and white in the US, we must, we must not become complacent that this exist in stark contradiction to the principles that our society upholds to be true. By all measures, segregation, segregated community, educational level, economic out outcomes, health outcomes, political uh, representation, the failure of true racial integration still exist. It is my mission and the purpose of the Moral Black Leadership Foundation to not accept or become complacent to these shortcomings, but to confront them with a recommend, with a recommend, uh, recommitment to the powerful godly values of family, service, and most importantly, brother and sisterhood. Reflecting over what America is facing today, we remember Benjamin Franklin stating when he asked, it's a republic if we keep it. The question is, what are we keeping in this time of turmoil? What is it that we have to keep? What we must keep and expand upon are the basic values underlying the fundamental principles of America. This is, was, and must always be the backbone of this nation. It is only by recommitting to and further developing these values that we can extricate ourselves from the eyes of the global community's accusation of hypocrisy. Because when it comes to race relations, we're still not practicing what we preach. Our country is called upon to uphold a profound and moral stance before the rest of the world. It is only the, this moral stance rooted in Judeo-Christian values that has made this country sustainable, a sustainable Republic applauded by history. But we have long been in violation of those very values, leaving us vulnerable to global accusations, especially in the area of race relations. The black and white problem periodically raises its head as it did once again in May 25th, 2020 with the eyes of the global community intently watching on. We ask the question, why the conflict between Russia and Ukraine? We see Russia's notorious aggression 
and we have to ask why. It goes back to values. When the Soviet Union fell, the Russian political system was not decommunized. The use of public political power is still corrupted by the residual of communism. That sees individuals as comrades in the political struggle, not from the angle of brotherhood or sisterhood. Russia could not decommunize. America's job is to dehypocratize such that its founding principles more perfectly prevail within and therefore serve more effectively as a model nation toward the global community. America has failed to set the standard of brotherhood when it comes to black and white. And because creating the model nation is contingent upon the relationship between what I like to refer to the two brothers, the black and white brothers must not look upon each other from the premise of race, but from the premise of being brothers within the family of God. When they do so, they will find a commonality which leads toward restoration, reconciliation, and a unified society. And then America will be able to fulfill its ultimate responsibility of becoming an example of bridging the divide. Let us look at America's historical figures and what they had they espoused. President Calvin Coolidge in 1924 stated this, the principle of equality is recognized it follows inevitably from the belief of brotherhood, the brotherhood of man through the fatherhood of God. It seems perfectly plain that the right of equality has for its foundation reverence, reverence for God. If we could imagine that swept away, our American government could no longer survive not long survive. Hubert, Herbert Huber, 1935, the American system of liberty is based upon certain inalienable freedoms and the protection on which not even the government may infringe. Behind them is the conception, which is the highest development of Christian faith, the conception of individual freedom with brotherhood. And last but not least, Martin Luther King in 1963 stated this in his prolific famous speech. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners with the, will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. Now is the time to lift our nation from the quicksand of racial injustice to the solid rock of brotherhood. We must live together as brothers or perish together as fools. It is obvious that our values are being confused, forgotten about, and not adhered to. In essence, what we are trying to keep is a system of government and a society that understands, upholds, and lives up to the Judeo-Christian value system. Godly values do not lead towards social and cultural and political division, but rather toward unity. Godly values are universal values not exclusive to any faith tradition. These values enable the heart and attitude to bridge divide, the, divide, the, the divides. This appreciation for the universality of values was advocated by Reverend Sum Young Moon, who is the inspiration behind these sessions. In this quote, Reverend Moon presents his, his approach to his historical meeting with the North Korean dictator Kill Kim il son as an example of these universal actions, values in action. As Reverend Moon states here, I was well aware of the ongoing trial regarding the Ki Kimura incident, which resulted from 1987 conspiracy between Kim il sung and Mikhail Gorbachev of the Soviet Union to send 25 Red Army operatives to the South to assassinate me. As I was about to meet this enemy, how could I overlook that and replace it with a heart of meeting one's long lost brother for the first time 
in thousands of years. I was struggling with that within myself. If I could come up with a solution, I knew I would be able to bring any vi villain to naturally surrender. I need to possess the heart of loving my enemy more than I love my sons and my daughters, my wife, my disciples, and my members. That is why miracle is in the history of recreation took place after our meeting. The world changed after I met Gorbachev. And the inner Korean summit was finally realized after I met Kim Il-sung. All kinds of issues were resolved at once. These facts prove that heaven is working. A new world is being created. This story illustrates the fundamental yet extremely challenging and rarely advocated Christian values of loving one's enemy. This principle was taught over and over and over again by Reverend Moon as essential to the practice of what he calls true love. In the context of the many issues raised in this paper, in this conference, such principles of heart should be indelible in our values that can win over and subjugate it and subjugate the divided world. As I conclude, the motto nation, America, has most certainly not come yet. Where else will the avenues toward the solution begin other than the premise, what I call the three brothers, black, white, and yellow, African, European, Asian, starting with two brothers, black and white, who have been the central protagonists within the history of our nation. Why has the power, what has the power to override the nefarious agendas and va value systems that are now prevailing and, and vi vying to prevail within our secular institutions? To prevail, it is imperative for America to uphold its godly founding principles. This is because indelible within those principles is the power to bridge differences with love, the power for two people to unite under a common banner of truth and the common banner of brotherhood, leading to our common desire to bring universal peace. Thank you. Thank you very much, Reverend Oliver. Those were indeed words of wisdom. And I like that. Shared values are like the paste for social cohesion. <laughs> that, the paste. They pointed out, how can we get that paste going? And how can we get it to be really socially acceptable? And not just acceptable, but becoming the norm where we not only talk the talk, but we walk it. Um, I, I like you, uh, you know, the fingers pointing back to me and you. How can I become de-hypocritized <laughs> before I ask my brothers in other nations to be decommunized? And, you know, not calling each other, you know, um, uh, um, uh, what call it, comrades, but uh, we see each other as living each other as brothers and sisters. Thank you very much, Reverend Oliver. Um, I'd like to call up um, uh, Dr. Alexander here. Thank you very much for your sharing. And I, I forgot to say it before, but uh, the PowerPoint, unfortunately, I have to apologize. It didn't show uh, well. It showed one of the slides, but that's maybe not what you intended. So anyway, thank you very much for uh, allowing us to hear your words that painted the picture. So we, I think we still got it. Um, I would like to ask, um, on, as a follow-up from the prior session one, uh, with the excellent slate of panelists, uh, there was one um, member there, Doug Bandow of the Cato Institute, who kind of posed the question. And I, um, he said, how 
to reach, how can we reach the good people in the USSR, uh, China and other places who are yearning for freedom from becoming nationalistic and resentful? So uh, does, do any of you um, like to address that? How can we reach in to the populace? Resentment, I mean, if you have a great uh, example, a personal example, like uh, uh, the leader of uh, Rwanda, Kagame, who, who said it himself, that's one thing. If you have it like um, the leader of South Africa after the apartheid uh, collapsed, that's one thing. Uh, but how can we reach to nations or the people of nations where uh, we have yet to find those uh, real examples. Uh, well, I, I can jump in if that's all right. Um, so, right. so yeah, okay, all right. So yeah, so um, this is this is uh, you know a, f a fantastic question, right? So when we talk about conflict resolution, we study a lot about uh, this idea of intergroup contact, which is based on like the contact hypothesis, right? Which is the idea that if you bring people together, so for example, right. Uh, you know, Reverend Oliver was talking about the problems, the racial problems in the United States, right? So bringing, you know, black and white Americans together, for example. Um, uh, and, you know, things like segregation are so problematic for so many reasons. But one of those reasons is that it keeps the populations away from each other. So they're not engaging, they're not building relationships, they're not transforming how they view each other. And it's even much harder when you're talking about, uh, you know, international divides, right? So when we're talking about you know, between Russians and Americans, for example, or even between Russians and Ukrainians. I mean, of course, um, you know, the, the way once war starts, the way that the groups are divided, it becomes so difficult to, um, to transform how people are doing each other on the ground because there's no way to interact. Um, and so one of the things we try to do in conflict resolution is to figure out ways to bring groups together. Now, it's not really possible when conflict is at its height, right? When war is going on, when people are, you know, um, when you know, when it's not really safe to travel around, right? There's a lot of restrictions. But um, once, you know, things have stabilized to an extent, one of the first things we try to do is think about how do we get people to meet each other, right? To connect. And the thing too to think about is connecting at all levels of society. So Lederach has a peace building pyramid where he talks about three tracks, right? So the, the track one is the top level leaders, right? So that's, you know, getting Putin and Zelensky and right, to sit down and have their conversations and their big government leaders. Um, the secondary level is, you know, people who have influence, but who, not, who are not necessarily in prominent government roles. Think of, you know, prominent religious leaders or others who are influential in society, but who don't have that official government position. And then at the bottom, you have the grassroots, you have the general population. And the thing is that leaders, you know, unless they're operating in a, an authoritarian regime like Putin is, leaders can't make decisions without the general populace agreeing to those decisions, right? So the big challenge is how do you make connections at all three levels of the pyramid to, to, to transform how people are viewing each other? And one more small thing I'll say is, you know, another thing we're really exploring and thinking about is, 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 virtu is virtual contact, right? There's been research on virtual contact as a way to transform how people are viewing each other. And virtual contact, they've been able to show that, you know, they've done research in Northern Ireland and Israel and Palestine with these segregated communities. And they've been able to show that like these types of connections can also still reduce prejudice and improve how groups are viewing each other. So yeah, those are just a few thoughts on how to approach the issue. Thank you very much, Dr. Cromwell. Reverend Oliver, did you have any other comment on that? Yeah, first of all, I, I would like to say Dr. Cromwell, Cromwell my your brother that um, I was asking myself when you were found out you were teaching uh, in the university system, I was saying to myself, well, what did he, did he graduate in kindergarten? <laughs> so, but anyway, <laughs> he looks so very young. Um, so, uh, you know, I think the approach that I'm taking is to, from two perspectives, one prevention. And when I'm talking about looking, first of all, America is poised in position, uh, and it has always been poised in the position to be um, playing a role, what I always call a prototype, because people are watching. Why I use the, un, you know, the word hypocrisy, unhypocritizing itself, is that because when you, even I heard Putin 
make reference to, well, America, you, you know, you haven't solved your own problem. How are you going to tell us to solve our problem? That means that people are looking at America from the eyes of an example. Somewhere along the line, even the enemy is looking from America, for example. So if America was upholding those various principles that we were talking about, we there that that America could have played a very more a more central role in prevention because people have been watching. So in that prevention process, we would have been re, what I call re, 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 recalibrating our our thinking and our views. I think Dr. Cromwell, you mentioned finding commonality. You know, when we find more commonality, we're less to strike one another. You know, or to 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 want to bridge a gap between one another, and that's why I use the the, the reference of brother and sister. See, if I we, I keep looking at race, or I keep looking at um, Ukraine and Russia as two nations, then I don't see them as brothers and sisters. You know, so then we're gonna fight one way or another. We're gonna find some disagreement, and we're gonna handle it as enemies. But at least there's a a, 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 a chance. You have a, a bigger chance to resolve the problem and, and reconcile the problem with reconciliation. If I see the person from different eyes and a different view, but in order to do that, we need an example to show that this does work. And I feel that America um, in its founding has the potential to do that and has not been able to do it substantially. That's why the eyes, the eyes of the people keep looking in America. Well, you try to tell us to stop something. Well, you haven't stopped yours. Thank you very much, Reverend Oliver. Uh, I just um, want to, uh, I'm thinking about this. Uh, right now we have embargo and uh, some kicking out of diplomats and ambassadors from here and there and not talking to each other. So it's very hard to build relationships in that way. <laughs> How do we, you know, it's, uh, that seems to be a following on onto the war, a total uh, war in a sense of in all spheres of life that's stopping these relationships and and uh, the is is it that this has to go on until the the pain is too great so we open our hearts or enough people have died what what your comment what what do you what do you see is a uh, is it virtual uh, connections that can bridge a gap Renal, you want to go first this time? <laughs> well, the, you know, I, you know, see, the topic to me um, are, are are values, right? Uh, we might have a problem with maybe the underwriting or undergird of, of Ukraine, but uh, Zelensky is actually galvanizing the community um, because, first of all, he's he's uh, you know, he's standing on some values of standing for my country, wanting to see peace, sacrificing, you know, all those things, which is connected to values, you know, for the greater good. He's not high, he's not running away into another country, but he's right there in the midst of the battle with his family, his friends, his people that he's serving. So those are, so, uh, you know, those are indication of values. And this is what we're talking about. So I think that um, from there it could be a more uh, of a, a galvanizing type of um, point that uh, we can probably center around and uh, and see that uh, the 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 in people are, are extricating and going this direction and going that direction and people are not being able to uh, um, because people as uh, Dr. Cromwell said. In the heat of the matter, in the heat of the situation, people are just seeing red. They can't see anything, you know. So it's it's becoming of of us incumbent of us to uh, certain people to begin to help them calm down and see uh, where we need to go from uh, from a value perspective, you know. So that's the best I can do to answer your complicated question <laughs> no it, no it's a great answer and i think the values right are, are critical all along and i think as you said if you stop 
you know, as Rev, you know, as Reverend Oliver said, if you stop seeing them as brothers, then you're never going to get anywhere, right? But the question is, I think, you know, when you have this aggression like this, you have to respond powerfully. You know, the United States is the most powerful country in the world. You know, we we uh, if we do not stand, you know, and our allies, of course, if we do not stand up to brutal dictators when they invade democratic dem democratic countries, this is absolutely unacceptable. We have to stand up because otherwise. You know they'll just keep doing whatever they want, and and it show you know Xi Jinping is going to invade Taiwan if, if if the U.S. and the EU don't have a strong enough response. So there is no doubt in my mind that the embargoes and the sanctions that have been put in place, and the the support of Ukrainian military is absolutely essential, and we need to be doing more than we are, to be honest. Right? Zelensky is asking for a lot more military support, and we we need to be giving it. So I think. And that's the thing about, you know, conflict resolution and peace building. It's not, you know, and, and of, course there's, of course there's disagreements in the field. But the thing is, you know, there are some pacifists. But the assumption that we have to be pacifists, I think, is ridiculous when it comes to people who are, you know, blatantly engaging in human rights violations, engaging in genocide. We have to stand up to those things, right? And we have not done a good enough job standing up to China or Russia. Um, but, of course, the point is, how do you keep seeing them as you know, as brothers and sisters all along, how do you keep loving them, even though they're your enemy, right? And recognizing that what they're doing is wrong, but they're still my brother, right? Um, and so I think that's the big challenge. But, but in terms of how negotiations work, right, Russia needs to hurt enough, they need to experience enough of a crisis to go to the negotiation table. This was the same strategy of Martin Luther King, right? You use nonviolent action to force the oppressors to come to the negotiation table and take you seriously because if you don't push them to the negotiation table if you don't create a crisis then they're not going to take you seriously enough you know there's been plenty of negotiations between russia and, and ukraine already they've resulted in nothing because russia isn't hurting enough it was the same with assad in syria it was the same with milosevic in kosovo in, in coast you know in 1999 right um, milosevic came to the table in rambouillet in france um and the KLA on the opposing side signed the accords and Milosevic sat there and refused to sign because he didn't have to. And he set up all his forces and was ready to invade Kosovo and refused to sign. So he had his forces all ready. So then NATO starts a bombing campaign, right? 77 days later, uh, the bombing campaign, right, completely uh, dismantles Serbian forces. They, they're receiving way too much hurt. So four months later, they go to the negotiation table. Guess what? Milosevic agrees to all five points he didn't agree to in the previous negotiations. So you have to put pressure on dictators. You have to put pressure on bad actors because they will just sit at the table, say whatever they need to say, and then go to whatever they want. Putin's been doing that for decades. So um, anyway, those are my thoughts on how to respond to that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Guess I'm emotional here. That's good. So uh, it seems like... Uh, if we go beyond this uh, current crisis of uh, Russia and uh, and Ukraine, how how is uh, how can we help people in a preventive way to uh, look at uh, uh, the world as you, Reverend Oliver, say as brothers and sisters? How can we uh, get uh, people of different nations to look at uh, as on? At us as one humanity, as brothers and sisters. How can we get the power to go beyond my individual grudges? How can we transcend this, Reverend Oliver? What's you? Yeah. How can well, we do that? you know, I go back. I want to thank uh, Dr. Cromwell what he just said as well. But I, I go back to what I said earlier uh, when I heard uh, some of people that we know that were there in Ukraine in the midst of the battle and in the midst of the chaos. And um, one of the things that uh, I got from them was that the problem is with uh, uh, Russia right now is that when the Soviet Union fell, what it failed to do was to decommunize itself. So where communism has a certain value system that has nothing to do with brotherhood, but more of comradehood or whatever, or the statehood. So therefore, they don't have compassion. So uh, for others, they don't see others, they just see from their own point of view. Uh, so there is where the values come in, and that's why they are able to do what they're doing without any remorse. Well, this is why I was bringing why it's necessary 
to the negotiation table for America to un hypocritize themselves so that their value system that is the underwriting of this country that has already proven to be applauded in its own in the midst of its chaos and in the midst of its mistakes and to be a potential um uh, uh, uh um mediator for the right negotiation table to help prevent crime and also help heal those crimes you know uh and and bring people to the table of of a negotiation for final peace first is i agree with dr uh cromwell at this point you have to have uh peace through strength you know what i mean you have to show strength but as you we're showing strength we still come to the table uh to show a, another paradigm of, of negotiations in order to bring what may be sustainable and measurable peace between nations okay thank you Maybe I just to jump in here. We are running short of time here. I mean, I like to stay with with you guys all day and talk about this. It's very stimulating. But uh, and uh, you know, I I would ask uh, Dr. Cromwell here about this uh, justice and peace meeting in a kiss. I like that. That's you know, uh, embrace and you know, good stuff. But anyway, maybe I just ask you for uh, making some concluding remarks here. Maybe you start with the. Uh, Dr. Cromwell, and uh, before we have to wrap up, thank you. Thank you so much. I also see a question in the comment here, which I want to, uh, in the chat here that I want to address. It's a question about, do you think sufficient effort, time, and patience was made to negotiate to try to understand the position of both sides before hostilities started on February 24th? So I'll answer that briefly and then say some final thoughts. So yeah, this is a good question, right? You know, what, you know, did we take Russia seriously enough before they invaded? I think that we, um, I think that maybe more, you could always say more could have been done, but Putin was making some pretty unreasonable um, requests, right? Saying that the United States wanted the United States to basically ensure that Ukraine wouldn't join NATO. And first of all, that's not the position of the United States or NATO members to do, right? That's the position of Ukraine as a sovereign country. So I think that what was expected of the United States was, was and, and, and its allies was a bit, um, was a bit unreasonable. And also, uh, you know, it's true that you can always do better to understand both sides, but I think the strategies and tactics of Putin show that he's not uh, necessarily, right, the kind of too trustworthy of a person to be working with. Um, but to, to wrap up though, I do wanna just say, you know, thank you very much for having me on this panel. And I think, you know, just to conclude, I think the fundamental kind of point or goal is thinking about, you know, how we can, again, figure out how to connect despite all our differences, despite, right, all the, the terrible things that we see, despite the violence and the struggles, and how we can still, right, see each other, as Reverend Oliver was saying, as brothers, as family, um, and really find out how to love in, despite, you know, the terrible violence and hate that we see. Thank you. Reverend Oliver. Yeah, just in short, I want to thank Dr. Cromwell. I, I enjoyed your presentation, by the way, as well. And um, so, uh, yeah, in, in, in short, uh, out of chaos and corruption, out of chaos and confusion, out of chaos and, hope, um, and war, there must rise hope. And that hope really starts with us individually. The hope, what I would say, starts with what we call of a I like to call an alternative voice that is not there. We have here all the voices and other noises, but alternative voice. And, 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 and I think it's just indicative of this, uh, the topic, you know, that we're talking about and that's um, values. We have to go back to our value systems because values transcend race, culture, and, you know, ethnicity and everybody values values, you know, uh, and so <laughs> once we come to that, I think that we can find uh, a more sustainable um, negotiation um, table of peace with the enemies uh, with, and find some commonality. Thank you. Thank you very much, Reverend Oliver. Dr. Cromwell, I am much, very pleased to have made your acquaintance over the Zoom. 
<laughs> or over this internet connection and uh, maybe we can make connections all around the world and make this as one another expression to make world peace as we understand each other more and more so thank you very much for taking the time to be here and to all those of you in the audience we appreciate you taking the time to think about values think about how we can diffuse uh, current burning situation and uh, prevent these kind of things to happen in the future by us, as I've learned, living out our values back here at home. Maybe even me in my relationship with my family and my neighbors. I mean, wow, that'll be a change, right? Thank you very much for joining with us. And Thank you, doctor. see you shortly on the next session.